conceptual perspective. Talk about all of the elements. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Everybody is off to a great start in this year. Hope that you are doing things that you set out to do. I'm really, really pulling for you. Uh, and I mean that genuinely. I want people to win in this world. I want people to get on in this world. Uh, before I get started, you saw the intro video. You know uh, the importance of the work we do at the Odyssey Project. I cannot stress enough uh, our need for you to support the work we do financially. Uh, the likes and the shares and the subscriptions are great, but we need you to support the work. We need work for the research uh, center. We need work for the um, think tank. We definitely need work for programs like Black Men Lead, uh, which is a rite of passage initiative and with wraparound services for mental health uh skills training and so much more for black men we also have a program designed to help young black women uh who could be str struggling with trauma struggling with uh domestic violence struggling with intimate partner violence and so much more and we will continue to do what we do but it would be so much easier and we would have such a greater reach if our people would actually get behind what we're doing and support it. What you see that we do is me. There are some people who have been wonderful that have given $100 here, $50 there, $10 here. Every dime that comes in, and it comes in sporadically. I mean, extremely sporadically. We may have a $60 a month, $100 a month, uh, something like that. And then there are months that are worse. And I'm talking about donations, total donations. Uh, and I think that anything that we do definitely exceeds that uh, to a great extent, but we don't give up. I've been doing this for decades now and we don't give up. We find a way we push, but we need the community behind the things that work. It's that simple, so I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you to click the link in the description box. I'm challenging you if, um, to give um, and support the work we do. If you don't wanna click the link and you wanna give by way of Cash App, that information's in there as well. I wanna just take a brief moment to talk about something here. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm a part of media, so I have media feeds. And so you get all kinds of stories that are just coming in on the media feeds. I get more, to be honest, I get more information off of just getting and studying social media because stuff happens in real time. But there are some things that come through media feeds. You go, what? And you look at it and, you know, you have to sometimes just really sit there and go, what in the hell just happened? What were they thinking? And this story here is one of those stories. But I want to take a different approach. 
because I think we need to work on solutions. I think we need to work on healing. I think that we need to work on building. It's so easy to point fingers and we do it so well. It's so easy to say whose fault it is. It's so easy to talk. I want to work on solutions. I want to work on healing. I want to find ways to undress, unravel, and uh, actually assess what's going on in a way that we can set up and create strategies, agendas, blueprints that will lead us to a better version of ourselves independently, individually, and as a collectively. And as a collective, we have so much that we're capable of, but we're missing it. This story uh, that as presented in the title uh, is about a young black sister uh, who has been arrested and she was arrested because her two-year-old child was run, wandering around in a public parking lot while she was getting waxed. How that happens, I don't know. And the easy thing is, is to take aim at her and just dig in and attack. And there are going to be enough people who are going to do that. Enough people are going to attack her. Enough people are going to talk about how irresponsible she is. Enough people are going to talk about how it's all women's fault. Enough people are going to sit up and say, what if the daddy was doing it? It's... There are going to be enough people that are going to come up with all the different angles of why it happened. But at the end of the day, there was a two-year-old kid in a parking lot. Here's the thing that concerns me about this. Is when I see a kid wondering and the parent isn't around. Yes, my first, my first thought is, where in the hell is the parent? The second is, where is the village? And what we don't realize is when you hear me uh, lamenting individualism and you think it's not a big deal, let me tell you what individualism did. It destroyed the village. Individualism, individualism diluted the force of the village because everybody became about themselves. Everybody started to look out for only themselves. Everybody sit up and took a it's about me approach and what I want to do and nobody tell me anything. And then nobody says, well, if nobody can tell you anything, nobody's doing anything uh, for you. And then what you look at is you got a bunch of people standing independently of, uh, of one another, but not having the force, the power, the resources to be independent. So you got a bunch of independent people with no real true independence standing individually and separately from one another and trying to navigate these labyrinthine corridors of a white racial caste system that's designed to keep you at bay, to keep you discombobulated, uh, to keep you out of focus so that you never really truly discover who you are. So you never really truly develop a sense of self at a level that drives you to be who you're really meant to be, that pushes you into a place of power, confidence, and certainty about your future. So you start to act and behave differently, not just to yourself, but to others within your periphery, within your collective, within your enclave. This individualism takes us to a place that sits up and literally dilutes the power of the grouping. And when you dilute the power of the grouping, you dilute the force to move as a collective. And that's what they've been pushing for so long. I cannot stress this enough. Nobody wants to be told anything. Nobody wants to be taught. Nobody wants to be led. Nobody wants to be mentored. Everybody wants to do their own thing, but everybody wants to hold everybody else accountable for what's going on in their lives. Everybody but themselves. This is not me trying to give any excuse for this young girl. She's, well, she's a mother, so this young lady uh, allowing her child to get away from her while she's, my whole thing is there's a level of thought processes that have to go through the mulling over of any particular situation. And in these thought processes, you ask yourself, okay, if I'm going to do this, what will it require me to do? In a situation where you're gonna have your attention on something else, you can't take a two-year-old without having somebody that will be responsible for them. You can't sit a two-year-old in a seat and say, don't move, mommy will be back. That doesn't happen. You can't do it at home. So what makes you think you're going to be able to do that in a public setting? Now, 
I, I am thankful because this could have turned out a whole lot worse. The kid could have gotten hurt. The kid could have gotten kidnapped. And that would be catastrophic and devastating. Um, there's a good chance this young lady may lose this child. Uh, I'm not going to speak on whether or not it should happen, but if you're going to be irresponsible, the child needs responsibility, but here's the problem. If she loses a child and the child goes into child protective services, the child is probably actually in a worse situation in most instances than if they would have come up with a more reasonable and practical solution. Is there somebody in the family? Is there someone that can come home? Is there courses and classes that this young lady can take? Is is it something that we need to be doing in the community? And the answer to that is absolutely. Uh, I've laid it out many times. We are definitely going to have to become more involved. We're going to definitely have to rediscover the village. You cannot operate and build enclaves, do things and talk about achieving things on a collective level when you can't even move collectively. How that makes sense to anybody. I don't know. We're going to have to learn how to love ourselves enough to become re-engaged with one another in places that's right now uncomfortable because we are so consumed with self that we don't see anything else going on. We don't hear anything else going on. That's another reason why it's hard to get behind programs that are doing things because if it's not affecting me, I, I, I don't see the value in it until it hits me. And then you're at the doorstep of the people who are trying to do this and you're saying, look at me, help me. It's I've seen this in so many instances. People that were never active until their son got killed by a police officer, until the, their sons or daughters uh, got mishandled in school, until uh, they needed mental health resources or they lost a child or a loved one uh, to suicide, then all of a sudden the resources are important and and they are and I'll never turn a person away if I can help it but it's based on resources but let me tell you something you don't wait until it lands on your doorstep to see the value of it it's your people going through something our people are literally suffering what we see when we see this little baby walking through the parking lot is the result of a failure within the community long before the mother became who she is in, 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 in being a person that allowed it. Something happened there before that, and that's the reality of it. There is a social standard that is substandard to what's necessary for us to be who we are capable of being. We're not holding ourselves accountable. We're not holding one another accountable. We're not pushing, and we're, we're not being what we need to be. And it's because we don't see the need until the need lands at our doorstep. We don't see what's necessary until it's us hurting. And then we want everybody to move heaven and earth to come rally around us when the truth is we should be working proactively to build, to heal, to develop, to grow. And if we're talking about our children being our future, then we've got to be holistically educating them and preparing them for success. And if you've read my 16th book, The Miseducation of Black Youth, or my 24th book, Academic Apartheid, then you've seen my definition of holistic education. Education is way more, far more than simply the attainment of academic skills. Education in its truest sense is the empowerment and preparation of our children so that when they grow up, they become adults that have the capacity, the force, the knowledge, the, 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 the awareness, the self-identity and self-concept to be able to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete, but win. And they have what they need inside of them, but it's our responsibility to tap into it, to discover their genius, to discover who they are, to make them aware of their genius, to make them aware of their identity, to make them aware of what they are supposed to do in this world, to give them a sense of self. That's what socialization is about. And that's why socialization is so important to young black males. This is why I created Black Man Lead. Why? Because if we don't socialize them, they become a target and they become subjected to being a target. They are targeted as early as five years old for special special education referrals to be ostracized 
uh, within the uh, academic, the public education system. And once they become ostracized and they become alienated in this system, it's a matter of time before they step out of it prematurely in large numbers. We have a very serious problem with the dropout rate. Well, we know for a fact that when black males drop out of school prior to getting a high school diploma, it increases their chance of becoming incarcerated between four and five times. So now we have them in the uh, school to prison pipeline because we are trusting our enemy to do what we should be doing. We have to be willing to understand that it's more to educating our kids than simply learning how to 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 to, to do math and and everything else. yes we need to know how to read we need to know how to write we need to know how to manage numbers but we need to also have an understanding of self we need to be psychologically and sociologically prepared we need to be uh prepared on the understanding of how we move in business we need to understand the difference between currency and money we need to understand how to build the right relationship with money. All of these things are things we're supposed to be teaching these children and these why these programs are so important because they do this in a place that is supplementing the fact that we have 1.5 million men missing, uh, 1.3 of them in prison, uh, the other um, 200,000 um, checked out for whatever reason, addicted to drugs, mental health issues, whatever. We've got a gap that we have to fill. We can't use that as an excuse. We need to step up. We need to be in charge of our own destination, our own destiny, our own outcome. Do Are we owed reparations? Absolutely. And that needs to be a part of our think tank that focuses on how we're going to pursue it, how we're going to demand it, how we're going to achieve it. But it can't be our savior. It can't be what we are waiting on for us to rise up. We've got to learn how to work within ourselves. We have to learn how to get behind programs that work. We have to learn how ourselves to be engaged and involved and to care long before we're ever in need of any services. We should be supporting them. We should also every day be looking for ways to improve ourselves. We have a responsibility to ourselves to our progeny, to all of those who are part of the collective, to be our best and to be our best to ourselves and to one another. They have us so gassed up individually in so many different ways, uh, in, as, as individuals, gender-wise, sexually or our sexual orientation, uh, our our ethnicity, uh, if we are not foundational blacks and we are over here from different places, the little flags that represent the little place we at that gives us diff a, a different identity, but we have the same origin and we are all falling, uh, falling uh, prey to this division. You know, they divide us in the hood. They divide us by socioeconomic status. They divide us by academic achievement. They divide us by so many things. And everybody's looking at themselves and saying, well, I'm doing this so I'm better than them. I'm doing this so I'm better than them. Nobody's better than anybody. I'm not better than any of my brothers and sisters. I may be in a different place, but I'm not better. I may be behaving in a way that people perceive to be better, but I'm not better. I'm not better than anybody. So that allows me to come work with anybody and to love on everybody and to try to lift up. And that's the challenge I'm giving you right now. We've got to get out of this. We've got to stop allowing ourselves to be used against ourselves. And you're probably going, how did this dude get a kid walking in a parking lot to here? It's because I spent 30 plus years of my life studying the behavior. Read Born in Captivity. The link is in the description box. Read The Undoing of the African-American Mind. It's in there. Read academic. If you read, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Everything is connected. There are no coincidences. There are no coincidences. Nothing just happens. Everything is orchestrated. How you think, what you move. Well, I mean, how you move. The fact that we're so uh, 
driven by consumerism isn't an accident. And so we've got to reclaim ourselves. We've got to reclaim our minds. We've got to reclaim our identity. We've got to reclaim our place. That's our responsibility. We put so much energy, effort, and money into trying to be what they are and what we think they want us to be that we are losing ourselves more and more every year and we are leaving ourselves subject to whatever they want to do to us and it's on us. We lose because we refuse to learn how things work. How many times have you said, the worst thing that you could be is in a situation trying to play a game you don't understand. Look, I'm going to get ready to get off from here. Uh, hopefully, you know, I shed some light. Uh, but that's my passion. I, uh, I could easily just jump all over it like a lot of people are going to do and just, you know, uh, go after and tear down. Uh, it was very irresponsible. I don't think you have to go any further than that. It was irresponsible. Uh, but what we need to talk about is how we got there. And see, nobody's going to do that. Everybody's going to talk about the outcome, but nobody's going to talk about causality. And because we don't talk about causality, we never get to the core of why things happen so that we can address them. We deal with symptoms all the time. And as long as you're addressing symptoms, you're never going to truly heal. You're never going to truly grow. You're never truly going to become more powerful and expansive. You have to be willing to say, where did that come from? You have to be willing to have the means and the resources to confront it, to deal with it, and to overcome it. Whining is not a plan or a strategy. Pointing fingers of blame is not a plan or a strategy. What is the plan and the strategy? The plan is to become better. The plan is to learn and understand why things are happening so that you can change them. So that you can create systems that overcome them. So that you can become powerful within yourself. The quote, the African proverb if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. If we confront the enemy on the inside, if we deal with that, uh, and we deal with it emphatically, we deal with it holistically, we deal with it deep down, and we develop and we become what we're capable of becoming, it doesn't matter what they do anymore. We are subject and vulnerable to what they do because we are still dealing with internal issues that make us vulnerable. My suggestion is that it's time to start dealing with the enemy. And on that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Again, show some love, show some support. Look in the description box, click the link, and give. If you prefer, the organization's cash app handle is also in the description box. On that note, I'm out of here. Thank you guys for lending me a bit of your time.